Step into Wix Studio, the web creation platform built for agencies. Yes, I said eggs for cholesterol. You can eat eggs, everybody. <laughs> Studies showing. How- Rescue the- 
the perishing care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We pour the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the Everybody's able to make it out, and uh, trust that we'll see more later on here. Um, we have a few announcements that we need to go through. Michael Hauser is in Jackson Purchase Medical Center there in, uh, in Mayfield, and he has been moved out on the floor. He was in the intensive care unit, but he is in room 327 there at Jackson Purchase, and they have diagnosed him as having congestive heart failure. But his hemoglobin is low, and I mean it is low. And uh, so they are trying to get that built up. They've given him, uh, they're starting him on another unit of blood. I think, I think they started him earlier this morning on that. And so we need to keep Michael in our prayers. I know Sharon and Dylan would appreciate that. Betty Lehman, bulletin says, had an open heart surgery. Well, that's been several weeks ago, actually. Um, so she is at home, and I visited with her. And, uh, she was just very cheerful and feeling pretty good. 
And so uh, I think uh, it won't be long before her and Ken are able to be back with us. Kathy Frizzell, this is sister uh, of Anita and uh, Jan. Uh, she's at Oakview uh, Nursing and Rehab. Um, we have it down that she's in room 102. She had actually, I went over there to see her, and she had been moved. And, uh, but I don't know if she's, where, if she's in the same place she was last time or what, but uh, please keep her in your prayers. And Joel is doing much better, Joel Frizzell. Milton Jones will have rotator cuff surgery, if I'm not mistaken. It's this coming Thursday. And um, keep him in prayers. His dad had surgery on Friday. I've not talked to Milton yet to see how his dad is doing. Uh, David Hendrickson, uh, this is uh, Sharon and Donna's brother-in-law. He has, uh, he has leukemia and he's taking treatments for that. And my understanding is the treatments are giving him a little bit of trouble, as you can well imagine. Sandy Van Horn, this is Chris Adams' mother, is going to have surgery this coming Wednesday. And um, also, Dennis was telling me Marie is at home and uh, was asking for the prayers. She's had an awfully hard time lately, and the steroids that they're giving her are affecting her blood pressure and things like this, and she's really struggling. She needs our prayers. We need to encourage her all that we possibly can. Uh, and um, uh, Wayne Jones uh, will be seeing his doctor to discuss having some tests run. And I hope that everything goes all right. Please keep Wayne in your prayers. And uh, I'm trying to think. It seems like I thought of someone else and then just in and out of my mind that quick. Things don't take root in my mind very long. It's, they're not there long enough, Paul, to take root, you know. Have, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, if the deer were trying to eat the sprouts that come up in my brain, they would die of starvation, I'm afraid. These are immediately all the ones that I know about. Now, every week I find out about people that, uh, that I know in many other places. We could probably take the hour mentioning everybody's names that come to mind. It's hard to think of everyone, but if I have left anyone out, please bring that to my attention. We are in Hebrews chapter 3 today, and we'll start that in just a moment here. Um, and we'll have a prayer, but I do want to remind you we're starting in Hebrews 3, and we, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's about verse 7, 8, right in through there. And there's one thing in particular that I think we need to discuss that's vitally important. But uh, if you will, let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for the blessings you've so richly and abundantly provided. Father, we thank you for your kindness and your mercy toward us and ask that you will take care of us in this world and help us to do well. Father, we give thanks for Jesus. As our Lord and Savior, we believe, Father, the greatest gift ever given to mankind and that he came to this world to teach us and to show us the way to you, to open up that path and, Father, to die that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. We pray, Father, that we will always remember who we are, what we are, and that we will fulfill our purpose on this earth. Father, we are mindful of those who are sick and unable to be with us, and we know that our list is long, and we know that there are many others that if we were to add to this list would be longer still. Father, we know that there's a world of people who are hurting today, and we ask that you will bless each one and take care of the doctors who are providing for their care that everything will go well, that the doctors may apply their skills to these individuals and bring about the best situation for them that is possible. We thank you for this day and pray that as we worship you, we will do so in spirit and in truth. And we pray that you will someday give us a home with you in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I did forget to mention Cheryl Spiceland. She's uh, able to be here and she's doing better, but still having some pain associated with that uh, on her uh, on her eye and uh, so please keep her in your prayers and you may think of others uh, I want to thank the elders for giving me the opportunity to be at the Fried Hardeman lectureship last week the theme was revelation and heard some wonderful wonderful lessons and um, uh, it just confirmed uh, to my faith in the Bible department at Fried Hardeman and of course I have a natural uh, prejudice because Justin Rogers is the head of the Bible department now and um, 
uh, Rick Brumbach is the head of the graduate department of Bible. Both of these men are doing fantastic job, fantastic job, and I appreciate that. Well, we're in Hebrews chapter 3, and if I'm not mistaken, I think we begin with verse 7. Uh, and uh, or, uh, do we, or do we go, did we go on further than that? I cannot remember, just to be honest with you. Uh, I know that verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. And uh, wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest, there, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Well, the Hebrew writer here, you remember, we're looking at the book of Hebrews and understanding that there are some Hebrew Christians, Jewish Christians, who are uh, about to give up on their faith. And the Hebrew writers say, no, now don't do that. Uh, hold on to your faith. Uh, let me show you why. And he says, well, Jesus is superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses, the law. And he goes on with all of this, the priesthood and things like this. And then his point is there is no other answer. Jesus is the only answer for man today. And so he does this and he is trying to say, don't let there be an evil heart of unbelief. So he connects them to their own history. And he goes back in their history and he says to them, remember these people here. Remember the ones who were in unbelief. Now you have to hold on to that because here are those who are an example of unbelief. But then you get to Hebrews chapter 11 and you have the example of those who believe and their faith carried them through. And then in chapter 12, verse 1, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that doth so easily beset us. And uh, he goes on to uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame, set down at the right hand of God. What he's doing is, here are those who were in unbelief. Here are those who were in belief. These were punished. These were rewarded. These did not enter into the rest. These did. Now then, you follow them, the ones in belief. So here in chapter 3, you have, in a sense, a hall of fame of the unfaithful. Over in chapter 11, the hall of fame of the faithful. And the encouragement, and here he says, don't follow these people. But when you get to Hebrews 12, he says, do follow those people. You see what he's doing? And it's a wonderful teaching mechanism, isn't it, to do that? And that's what the Hebrew writer wants you to see. So he goes back and he says, uh, today, remember I made a point on that word today, and you're going to see it several times. The purpose of the word today is to bring out now. Now. You have opportunity now. This is the time that we have right now. We're not promised five minutes from now. So use your time now. <clears throat> <clears throat> Man, let me make a point. Um, there was a preacher in Bowling Green killed in a car wreck last Sunday afternoon or night. I can't remember which. Preacher at the, what's it called, Millie? Green Hills Church? It's not Green Hills. It's Greenwood. Greenwood Church of Christ. And I didn't know the man at all, but uh, at any rate, uh, he and his wife and two grandchildren are in the car and I don't remember if it was after church. I think it was after church. And they're headed back home and car goes off the road, goes through a fence. And this friend of mine that told me about it, he said, that man was my neighbor. He said, the odd thing about it was, he said, one of the boards on that fence came through the windshield. And he said, the thing is, he said, it had to hit at the exact right angle to go through that windshield. But guess what? That man had to be sitting 
in the exact right spot. Killed him. His wife and two grandchildren, they're fine. But killed him. And so this neighbor, uh, I'm talking to him on the phone about it. And uh, that was Thursday when we, when we went back to Freed Harbor. I, I can, got the thing in my car where I can hook up my phone. And he said, you know, said he had just finished preaching. I said, well, you know, the Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. He said, odd you mention that. That was his sermon topic. He had just finished preaching on that topic. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. That's pretty weird, isn't it? Today, now, while you have the time, do it now. And don't delay. Today, if you will hear his voice, don't wait and say, well, tomorrow I'll, I'll look it up. Today, if you will hear his voice, God says to do this, do it today. Because we're not promised tomorrow. And all of, we know that story. We know that. And so this is the emphasis, and this is why you need to look at that word today. Get you a pen. I always tell you to get a red ink pen and underline, but then after a while you underline everything in your Bible and you won't know what it means. So get you a black one this time and underline that word today. Go through your Bible and underline every time you see the word today. Now, sometimes it's just simply going to say, well, uh, today we're going to do this. Well, that's... but. When God admonishes you today, if you will hear his voice, it's got to be done now. There's no time to delay. There's no time to wait. Do it today. And then he says, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. One of the things that we need to remember is that the children of God tempted God on several, that I say tempted him, what I mean is they tested. In other words, they, they didn't believe. And so God would say something and they would pull back from it and things, or they would disobey him or something like that. And so over a period of time, this became sort of a feature of theirs, if you please, that they were in a, they, going on and on and on. And what happens is, that if you keep on doing a thing over and over and over, it becomes a habit. And it may be, if it's something that's sinful, it's going to bother you today. You do it tomorrow. Well, uh, that's, uh, you do it the next day and the next day, and it becomes a regular part of your life. You've hardened your heart to those things. Dennis? Yeah. He did promise the Jews tomorrow until Christ came and died and the church was but after the church was established, you have no promise of tomorrow. Yeah, there is no promise to, that tomorrow is going to come, and like I say, tomorrow never comes because when it comes it's today. And so uh, yeah, in the old testament you're looking forward to the time when Christ comes, but you've got to be prepared at every day and every moment. You've got to be prepared. And um uh, I, I don't, you don't see it anymore. I remember when I was a boy, you drive down the highway. Did any of you ever see these crosses that would be put up? Somebody put it up there and it would say, prepare to meet thy God. Every, I, I don't know how many of those I saw through the years. You don't see them today. And I have no idea. I don't know who put them up or I just remember seeing them. It, it, I, uh, they, they were almost as prominent as the old Burma shave. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of them were put up by the Methodists because a lot of them had that purple drink, on, which is the calling. Well, see, I never saw them with the purple drape on there. I, I, no, I, I mean, it could be, but I, I don't know. It was a good warning, and it's one that we need to pay attention to. Well, oh, go ahead. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I don't know, I, I don't know who put those up. Uh, Millie and I went down to Freed Hardeman Thursday. I'd been there all week, came back and did a funeral, and we headed back down there. Gary was leading singing. and uh, there, On the way to Freed Hardeman, there's this one place over to the right before you get to Lexington, Tennessee, and there's three tall crosses. Those were there when I was a dentist. They may have been there when you were a student. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I don't know who put those up. But I did read a story about the man that put them up. I just don't remember it. But it's been ages and ages ago. And they were primarily, I saw them in two or three places, but they were all down in that area. Uh, but the, today, and the children of Israel tempted God. They tested him. They didn't trust him. And this is what God, here's what I want you to understand. We talk about having faith in God. We need to. Having faith in God, believing in God, but that belief needs to involve trust. Their faith was not mixed with trust. It's one thing to believe in a thing. It's another thing to trust in that thing. And in this case, they did not trust God. And so they complained, well, we don't have any water. We don't have anything to eat. God, well, God gave them the water from the rock, gave them the manna and the quails and things like this. He provided for them. But rather than go to God and say, Father, we've had the manna for so many uh, months, years, whatever it is, and we appreciate the provision of this, but could we have something else? They didn't do that. They started complaining. And we're tired of this manna. Why do we have to eat this manna all the time? Well, when you first got it, you were happy with it. And so over a period of time, they were dissatisfied with things. And they complained and they tested God. And sometimes they went out on their own and did some things that they were not supposed to do. Uh, to me, the, the classic example, the, the, the one when they built the golden calf, and Moses comes down and he says, what's this golden calf doing here? And Aaron says, well, they all gave me their gold and stuff like that, and we put it in the fire, and out it came. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. That sounds like something a child would say, isn't it, you know? Uh, what, how'd you break that window? Oh, I was just playing in the house. Next thing I knew, that window broke. Uh, whatever. Well, so they tempted God. They tried God. They didn't trust God. And God is all along saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. So Numbers chapter 13, they send the spies over into the promised land to spy it out. The spies come back out of the 12 spies. Ten say, we cannot do it. And Joshua and Caleb are the only ones that say, look, God is with us. He will send us in there and we will do this. And the children of Israel even wanted to kill Joshua and Caleb. And so their rebellion, God says, all right, they're not going in. And that's what the rest of this passage then is talking about. It's talking about the times when that particular time. But the, we, need, we need to remember that's not the only. If that had been the only time, God might have been willing to work things around a little differently. But they did this over and over and over. They do it all the time. They do things that they're not supposed to. They, uh, it's, it's just amazing how they keep doing the different things. And then when they get in trouble, they complain about it rather than humbling themselves and going to God. And they had the sign. God dealt with them daily, but they put their trust in idols, which didn't absolutely nothing for them. You know, and, and Dennis, you see, you have introduced a sermon idea. Now, so I'm sorry I'm going to have to do this, but I'm going to preach a little while. I've had people say to me before, you know, if I could see the miracles that God did to the children of Israel and that Jesus did and everything, I'd believe. Really? The children of Israel didn't believe. The disciples, well, some of the, I'm going to say the ones who followed Jesus didn't believe. Jesus fed 5,000 people on one occasion, 4,000 on another occasion, multiplying bread and fish and like this. He fed these people. They didn't believe. They left him. They left him. Go read John chapter 6. They left him. And uh, the, uh, the, the Jewish leaders saw Jesus. They knew that a man had been healed, and they said, oh, he didn't do that. said, he did that by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus said, now you blaspheme the Holy Spirit.
Yeah, they, the you know. We, you know, there. Uh, you look at Job for just a moment. One of the things that you find in Job, the phrase comes back several times. In all this, Job did not sin with his mouth. Now he complains a lot. I don't know why this is happening. I want to know what's going on. You know, Job doesn't understand. You know, the problem that I have with with Job is Gary Knuckles would have complained. I would, I would have said, what in the world are you doing? You don't have any right. Job just says, I don't understand. I don't understand. But in all of this, he did not sin with his mouth. And uh, Job never claimed to be a perfect man. But, as a matter of fact, we learn of Job's righteousness through God's testimony, not through Job's own words. He just said, well, I tried to do my best. And he said, I was not without sin. I did sin. But I don't think I deserve this and things. Yes. To begin. Yeah. He, his wife said, curse God and die. And instead he blesses God. So anyway, here the idea is, and so he goes on and he, uh, verse, uh, he talks about hardening your hearts. We talk about Pharaoh hardening his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart by continuously saying no. God comes to him and gives him a choice. And Pharaoh says no. He keeps coming over and over and over. Ten times that I remember, ten times that he comes and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says no. And then he begins to say, well, uh, let them go and we'll do this. And uh, I had a sermon one time that I preached uh, called One More Night with the Frogs. You remember they had the frogs in Egypt? And Pharaoh, uh, Moses says, we can get rid of all this if you'll let us go. And he says, tell you what, he said, uh, you all stay here one more night and then you can go tomorrow. How many people are there living in sin today that, well, tomorrow I'll get rid of that. Tomorrow I'll stop. To, tomorrow I'll repent. One more night. with Too many people want one more night with the frogs. John? Yes. And for us, you can't worship in the world. You gotta be in the church. Yeah. You gotta be in the state before you worship correctly. Yeah. Be accepted. And then he says, Oh, you men go. Go ahead, that's what you want to do. You men go. Let the women and the children and the cattle and all stay back. Yeah. Yeah. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screw Tape Letters, uh, Satan is showing his nephew how to uh, uh, tempt people. And he says, Let him go to church. That's all right. Just don't let him get serious about it. And the world does the same thing. And the word here for harden, and I bring this up only because I think it's interesting, is the Greek word scleruo. Scleruo. Do we have a word in English today that sounds like that? Scleroderma. We, you know, our medical profession especially has adapted a lot of the Greek to modern English. Harden not your hearts. And here's the thing. It's our responsibility. Um, uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart. It says, well, God hardened his heart. No. Some people think that what God did was make it where he couldn't change. Where he couldn't come back. No, no, no. God always gives us the freedom of choice. 
So how did God harden Pharaoh's heart? He kept going to him. He allowed him to use his own will to turn and to make these decisions. And as Pharaoh is doing this, uh, ha have any of you ever had a doctor told you stop doing something? And he told you over and over and over again and you kept on doing it? My, uh, my dad had a brother who had a problem with alcohol. And he called dad one day and said, well, the doctor gave me the word. Told me if I keep on drinking, I'm going to kill myself. He said, so I'm going to give it up. He didn't. Did the doctor harden his heart? No, he did. And here's the point. Uh, some people think, look, let me, let, me, let me put it this way. Let's say for a moment that God made Pharaoh make those decisions and Pharaoh followed along with it. That means Pharaoh was doing the will of God. Right? And if Pharaoh was doing the will of God, why did God punish him? That doesn't make sense. Because God rewards the righteous. So we've got to be careful here. And here the idea is Pharaoh hardened his heart. How? God gave him time and opportunity. But when you take time and opportunity and you throw it away, you become hardened and it becomes, and it's just like I've used the illustration before, that uh, on television today we're hearing language that 40, 50 years ago we did not hear. But I'll tell you what, when we heard it 40, 50 years ago, <gasps> I can't believe they allowed that on television. How many of us are doing that today? None of us. Because we've become accustomed to it. We're used to it. It's every day. We see it everywhere we go. It's in the commercials. It's in the shows. Uh, you can look in print media, and it's in there and things. What's happened? Well, we've sort of hardened ourselves to this anymore. We don't, you know, do we care? Ah, well, we care, but well, it's just what. And here's the children of Israel. God, over and over and over, He helps them, but instead they turn against Him. And as they turn against him, they go further and further and further away. And so then they harden their hearts. So he says, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. In the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, they saw my works for 40 years and nothing changed them. When someone says to me, well, if I could just see those miracles, I'd believe. No, you wouldn't. Remember, God raised a man from the dead. Been dead three days, took him out of the grave. And the people who knew about it refused to believe in it. I'm talking about the Jewish leaders. Right? We've got to be, no. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Not the miracles and things. Let us not be fooled. Let us not fool ourselves that if you saw a miracle, you would believe. Listen, I'm seeing guys on television do magic tricks and things that I have no explanation for. But I don't believe any of them are the Son of God. Uh, I think I've told this story before. I'll tell it one more time. Uh, for your boredom, but at any rate, one year on mission trip, we were going to, I don't remember which island, we stopped over in uh, St. Martin, and we were getting ready for our plane to fly on to St. Martin, I think we were in Puerto Rico, as a matter of fact, I know we were, and uh, somebody in our group came up to me and said, that's David Copperfield, you know, the magician, you've seen him on television, that's David Copperfield, that's David Copperfield over there, he's going to St. Martin on the same plane as we are, what do you think about that? I said, not much. And they said, why not? And I said, he made a plane disappear on television. I don't think I want to be in the plane with him. And uh, they, well, I hadn't thought about it quite like that. But everybody was running over and getting his autograph. I didn't do it. I, I, I thought, I don't, I don't want him to get mad at me and snap his fingers in the middle of that flight or something. But uh, what I'm saying is they saw the works of God. It didn't make any difference. And so he says, well, for, wherefore, verse 10, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Isaiah 55, verse 8. Wait, maybe it's 58, 5, 59, 5. 
It's in Isaiah, I'll put it that way. And it's in the 50s somewhere. But uh, he said, my ways are not your ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. So they have not, uh, and, verse 11, so I swear my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, just like this lesson before, take heed that there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We're going through this persecution. What is God doing to us? If we didn't believe God wouldn't allow, or we would have everything would be all right. Is this really following God? And the Hebrew writer is saying, yes, it happens. It happens. But instead, exhort one another daily while it is called today. Uh, during the 1800s, uh, if you were to attend a church of Christ in the 1800s, uh, what you would have seen is you would have had your singing and maybe a prayer or two, and then the preacher would get up and preach, and he might listen. Uh, I'm not making a case, but the preacher might go an hour or two hours, and then he would sit down. And a gentleman in the audience would stand up and he would exhort the congregation. Did you hear what brother so-and-so just said? He pointed this out from the scriptures and he's trying to get us to realize that we don't have time. And he would exhort. And I, I remember reading from one of the old restoration preachers that the, he said, I learned a lesson from one of the exhorters. It was a man in that local congregation, lived in that community and everything, and he got up and he said, friends, we have heard the gospel. He said, I learned. He said, the first thing I learned was from that word friends. He knew those people. He knew those people. And he got up. And he said, now friends, we've heard the gospel preached. There's some of you that need to repent. And the, and the exhorter then would give an invitation. I don't know how long it would go. But he would exhort. And then, he would, uh, if you need to respond to the information, uh, to the invitation, come down. And things. Well, at any rate, there's a great deal said in the scriptures about exhorting. Exhort one another while it is called yesterday, tomorrow, today. What we say about today? What's it mean? Right now. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful, incidentally. I did not know this. And I was studying this, and uh, the word deceitful here can also be translated delights or pleasures. Now put that together. Lest any of you be hardened through the pleasures or the delights of sin. Is there anybody in here beside me that likes ice cream? Milk, eggs, and basically natural products, right? And all like that. Oh, I love ice cream. So obviously, the more ice cream I eat, the better I'm going to be, right, Paul? It well, it hasn't worked for me either. I love ice cream. Millie will tell you. I, one time I, after church, one night in the winter years ago, I said, let's stop at Dairy Queen and get an ice cream. Don't you? It's winter. It's, what do you want to eat ice cream in the winter for? I said, if Dairy, King, if Dairy Queen didn't sell ice cream in the winter, they'd go broke. People eat ice cream even in the winter. Well, it does, but it's not Yeah. Well, you could have gone all day without saying that. Uh, would you say, Paul? <laughs> and the point is here, think about that. Is sin pleasurable? Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. You remember Moses? By faith, Moses, when he was, uh, by faith, Moses refused to be called, the, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure affliction than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Number one, they are pleasurable. But number two, they're only for a season. So don't be hardened through this. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence. Look at that word, confidence. Confidence, again, we've talked about this now. I mentioned it last week. Every time you see that word confidence in Hebrews, now get you a, get you a highlighter. You can get those in different colors. Get you a yellow highlighter and mark that word confidence in Hebrews. And words that go with it like boldness and things. 
Hold the beginning of our confidence. Steadfast. Hold on to it. Don't let go unto the end. While it is said, what? Tomorrow, if you will hear his voice. Today, now. Harden not your hearts as in the prophet. Here's another warning. They did it. Don't you do it. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. He's saying not all of them that came out uh, were punished. But with whom was he grieved? Forty years. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, twenty years old and above? Uh, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. When we get into chapter 4, he's going to call it a Sabbath rest. We'll talk about that. But the point that we're trying to make is to these Christians, and here some of them, some have already fallen away. Go over to Hebrews 10, look, verse 39. Uh, he talks about uh, we are not of those who draw back unto unbelief. Some had already fallen. Some were teetering, tottering, however you want teeter totter that the sun were tottering on the edge and the Hebrew writer is trying to say don't 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 give it don't 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 do this don't don't come back and to the strong he's saying don't ever get that way the Hebrew writer is doing everything he can to keep those people from giving up and losing their souls later in the church those who did give up were oftentimes referred to as the lopsy. That's a Latin term, L-A-P-S-I. We get our word lapse from there. They were lapsing. They were going over the edge. Don't do that. He says, hold on to your faith. Don't give up. There's more to it. There's a rest. It's coming. You wait for it. It'll be well worth it. And one of the examples he's going to give, remember Jesus? Yeah. He went through all of this. But now he's sat down on the right hand of God. So what do you want? Do you want to sit down on the right hand of God? Or do you want to risk the loss of your soul in Hades, in hell itself? Oh, I tell you what, the, can you imagine, I don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. I think it was Apollos, I don't know. But who, and I do believe that it was a sermon that was basically transcribed and everything. And can you imagine whoever this is standing up and preaching this? And he's probably not talking about it like we are. He's probably there. Don't do this. Don't give up. Hold on just a little bit. Like you're almost to the end of the race. Hold on. It'll be worth it. I could, I, I, I could just see him trying to encourage these brethren. And so let us take the lesson when we leave here. Don't give up. Doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Doesn't matter what happens in our government, in the politics, and on and on, and things, the wars and all like that. Don't give up. Hold on. God has promised. Well... So, Dennis, I'm sorry you got me all worked up there.
immerse yourself in academic excellence at a value rivaled by few. Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, the right place, the right people, so you can own tomorrow. Take your first steps to a promising future at SIUE. And welcome back to this U.S. Open office plan. Miller just lobbed a message way over Jones's head using some technical jargon. Oh, and Jones brings the heat with a per my last email. They need to start working together if they want to ace this project. Let's see if they can use Grammarly to their advantage. Jones is using it to make her point in a friendly way. And Miller is taking empathetic out for a spin. And this could be the tiebreak bill. Grammarly is an AI writing partner that helps you sound like the best version of yourself. And that's what we need to see here today. It's also super private, Jill. It keeps your data in your court. Oh, and now Miller's taking a technical doc and asking Grammarly to rewrite it. Just look at that. It's so much shorter and much easier to understand. And now she's serving it over to Jones in a blazing fast email. She tossed it up to Grammarly to get a quick first draft. What an angle. Let's see what makes the difference. It's love all, but does Jones feel it? Yes. Jones is leaving comments on the dock and using Grammarly to make sure they go straight down the line. Comments approved. Jones is sending the updated dock to the VP. And it's in. Incredible. She aced it. You know, they've been batting this back and forth for weeks, and now the team can finally move forward. Thanks to Grammarly, Every word you write helps you reach your goal. Download Grammarly for free. Good morning. 
Wow, that was a good, everybody feels good today. I didn't have to ask you to say it again. And uh, the weather outside is not frightful. It's enjoyable, a little cool. But that just means that next week it'll be about 70 degrees, sunshine, and uh, the leaves will start coming back out and things. I'm an optimist. But at any rate, it's good to see everyone today. We're glad you're here, and uh, we have several announcements we need to take care of. Uh, Michael Hauser is in Jackson Purchase uh, Medical Center over in Mayfield. He's in room 327, and he has been diagnosed with congestive heart failure, and right now his hemoglobin is low, uh, and they are giving him blood, trying to build that back up. Betty Lehman is here today, so we have no announcements. The, that's the biggest announcement, that she's able to be here. And we are glad, just tickled to death, that she's able to be here with us today. Kathy Frizzell, this is Anita and Jan's sister, uh, still at, Oak, at Oakview Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. Uh, Milton Jones will be having rotator cuff surgery coming this coming Thursday. And in addition to that, his father, Carl, had a procedure done Friday, and everything went well, and he's doing very well with that. Uh, David Hendrickson, this is uh, Donna and Sharon's brother-in-law. He has leukemia. He's experiencing some difficulty with his treatments, and we need to remember him. Sandy Van Horn, Chris Adams' mother, will have surgery February the 14th, and uh, that'll be this Wednesday. We want to remember her in our prayers for a successful surgery. Uh, Dennis was telling me a moment ago and seemed very concerned about Marie's uh, health. Uh, she's been having some difficulties laboring more to breathe, and things, and uh, the medicine they have given her has actually increased her blood pressure a little bit, uh, a little bit higher than it needs to be. So uh, please keep Marie in your prayers. I know she's struggling right now, and uh, Wayne Jones will be seeing his doctor to discuss having some tests run and things. Um, there will be a wedding reception for Joshua and Taylor on March the 2nd from 2 to 4, and they are registered at Amazon. I had to tease a little bit last week and say, well, they're registered at one of the car dealers here in Benton. But uh, that, I think that embarrassed one. Uh, I won't say which one she was, but at any rate. <laughs> but uh, remember them, that will be coming up. Uh, Titus Christian Prep School is collecting all kinds of soup to benefit Marcella's Kitchen in Benton. Uh, and this is a good work, and, uh, but if you will bring that soup, then uh, there will be someone here to deliver that. Uh, don't forget that a youth movie night is scheduled for Friday night. Uh, I believe that's yes, Friday night at 6 to 7 p.m., uh, 7.30 p.m. We'll have popcorn and drinks for everyone, and you might want to see Joshua for further details. Um, we are on PTP 365, and if you will go and look at that, we have a subscription. And there is a sheet of instructions that may be gone now. I may need to check, see, we need, may need to print more. But uh, this is a very good thing. And if you go on there and watch it, Gary Clark and I are kind of, I guess, the administrators. And we have to check that. But uh, you will be billed $1 a month. But I want to tell you something. For $1 a month, you cannot beat this. This is perfect for all kinds of lectures and classes and things like that. We encourage you to use that. Uh, we, if you need, if you would like to be a part of the cooking teams that help prepare the community meals, you might want to see LaDonna Ward about that. There is a Women of Hope weekend in, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, March, March 22nd, 23rd. The theme is Hope in Motion, and there's a list of the speakers in the bulletin. Uh, if you are volunteering for anything that we do here, and especially if it involves young people, we are trying to satisfy legal demands, insurance demands, things like this. There is a sheet that you need to sign. We need to do background checks. Now, we trust you. We know that you won't do anything wrong, but the police don't know that. So what we have to do is we have to have that, and this is to protect us. It's to protect you and to prevent any problems in the future. And if you will sign that and uh, leave us with your email address and so forth so that that can be submitted uh, for a background check and hopefully everything will be well. Uh, Wings Valentine Night will be Tuesday. And you know Wings is our uh, widow widowhood uh, ministry that we have. 
And if you would like to be a part of that, if you're a widow or a widower, uh, you're welcome to come this coming Tuesday night beginning at 4.30 in the multi-purpose building. Uh, there is also, we received in the mail a flyer, an announcement. There will be a widow widower's Valentine dinner at Philbeck Can at the Life Celebration Center, the old library. And uh, that will be Monday night at 5 o'clock. It's open to all who have lost a spouse. There will be games, a delicious meal, and an inspiring speaker. And we encourage you to attend that. If you, and if you're interested, they do need you to RSVP. Uh, and the phone number is given in the bulletin as well. It just immediately, these are all the announcements that I have. I hope I've not left out anything. But if I have, if you will see me after the services, I'll write it down and include it uh, in next week's bulletin. We don't want to leave anything out that needs to be uh, announced or uh, attended to. So please be sure to let me know what we need to do. Turn the service over to Troy Spiceland, who's going to read scripture for us. And then Jack English will lead us in our singing. You want to open your Bible and be turning to 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. 1 John 4, 12 through 14. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Our first song will be on the PowerPoint only. Let's all sing this morning. In the harvest fields now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Heart the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Does the place you call to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it, and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and our race earth is run he will say if we are faithful welcome home my child well done little is much when God is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Our next song will be 527. 527, he touched me. After singing this song this morning, Paul, Brother Paul Moore will be leading our opening prayer. Shackle by a heavy burden Neath the load of guilt and shame then the hand of Jesus touched me and now I'm no longer the same he touched me oh he touched me and all the joy that flow 
touch my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me whole. Since I met this blessed Savior, since He cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, He touched me, and all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me whole. Brother Paul. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful that we're allowed to be here to worship you. Father, that our health is good enough to allow us to be here. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day of life that you've given us. For even the air that we breathe, Father, we, we know that you've given us that. Everything, Father, that that we have and we do is all for and because of you. Father, uh, cause us to recognize if our hearts are being hardened. And Father, to change that. Continue, Father, to teach us to have penitent hearts. Might something even be said or done even, even this, this day, this hour, that might spark our hearts or this might spark someone's hearts to, to get to know you, to turn our minds and our hearts over to you. Father, that perhaps someone who has heard will realize just how serious all this is for our lives and for our eternal souls. And Father, that that, that person might turn their lives over to you. Thank you, Father, that uh, we can have remission of sins. Through, through baptism. Thank you so much, Father, for sending your Son to die in our stead. We might have hope of eternal life. Father, may those things even happen even today. Father, we are uh, thankful for our elders here, our leaders of this congregation, our Deacons, our preachers, thank you so much, Father, and ask that you'll give them wisdom and strength in all that they do. Father, uh, forgive me for not studying daily your word. There may be several of us that don't, and sometimes, Father, we forget to do that, and we just ask, Father, that you'll, you'll change our hearts and and calls us, calls us to study your word and, and Father, know more about you and, Father, that we might uh, direct others to, to know more about you, our neighbors, our friends, our families. Help us, Father, to, to trust in you. Cause our minds to be right. 
and our thoughts and our ways. We know, Father, that you love us. Thank you, Father, and ask that you'll give us mercy. Father, be with those who are mentioned that were that are ill or some recovering, and we're thankful for those that are recovering. Thank you, Father, for the doctors, the nurses, the medicines that's used to restore their health. Some of those names, and I know I'll forget some, is Michael Hauser and Verna Brewer and Betty Lehman and Kathy Frizzell and Joel Frizzell and Milton Jones and Sandy Van Horn and Marie Cavett. And Wayne Jones and David Hen- Hendrickson and Carl Jones, our nephew Devin, and Cheryl Spicelin, and my sister Marilyn, many others, Father, ask that you'll watch over and care for all of them. Father, be with our country, with the leaders of our country, be with our military. Keep them strong and guarding our rights. Thank you so much, Father, for watching over leaders of other countries. Help them, Father, to somehow or another turn their lives over to you and their thoughts and their words over to you. Ask, Father, that you'll be with us in the remainder of this service and the remainder of this day, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song before the Lord's Supper this morning, 321, 321, we'll sing all three verses. 321. Jesus the Lord lay His glory aside. Sinners to save and made whole. Freely he died, their transgressions to hide. What is he worth to your soul? What is he worth? What is he worth? What is he worth to your soul? He died on the tree for you and for me. What is he worth to your soul? All that was his for the sinner he gave. Pointed the path to the goal. Sin would be brave, but the Savior would say, What is he worth to your soul? What is he worth? What is he worth? What is he worth to your soul? He died on the tree for you and for me. What is he worth your soul? All who will trust him in sunshine and gloom shall when they reach the bright goal ceasing to roam be forever alone. What is he worth your soul? What is he worth? What is he worth? What is he worth to your soul? He died on the tree for you and for me. What is he worth to your soul?
There's many things going on in this world today. Things that we worry about each and every day. But the thing that we ought to remember and what's important to us, what's the most important thing in our life, is to be obedient to our Lord and Savior. He came to this earth to die for us. The greatest blessing that was ever given mankind. We all have an opportunity for salvation. He established this memorial for us as Christians to remember him. Not only on this Lord's Day, but each and every day of our lives. Remember what he did for us. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this bread which represents his body on the cross. Father, he was willing to come and die on the cross. He knew he was going to have to die. And he died for our sins. He died a terrible, terrible death for us. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this, that we remember the, the physical suffering that he endured for us. We pray, Father, that we will let our minds go back to the cross and, and remember what he did for us as we partake of this bread. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this fruit of the vine which represents the blood that he shed. And we know, Father, that he was the final sacrifice for sin. And we're so thankful that he was willing to shed his blood for us. That through his blood we might have the promise of eternal life. That we can go to heaven someday and live with you and with our Lord and our Savior. Help us to... Remember uh, what this does for us, Father. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Another part of our worship on the Lord's Day as Christians, we are to give back unto the Lord how, how a portion of what he has prospered us. And there's a, a box back in the foyer for you to put your contribution in. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to give back unto you a very small portion of Father, of what you blessed us with. We know, Father, you have given us enough money and material things to live. But we always, each and every day, need to remember where all these things came from. They came from you. Help us to give back unto you, Father, what we can always. And help us to be good stewards of everything you've given us. And help us as elders in this congregation, Father, to make sure that we're good stewards of what we have. That everything that we do should be pointed in the direction of saving souls, Father, throughout this world. Continue to be with us. Continue to bless us, Father. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Song of encouragement this morning after Brother Joshua's lesson will be 936, 936. And please turn in your, your book at this time, 985. We'll sing that song before his lesson. 985. Please stand if you'd like. 985. 
Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the way that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by, by and by, when the morning comes. All the saints of God are gathering home. Tell the worry how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. All of our cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed, and we wandered in the darkness, hearted and alone. But we'll trusting in the Lord, and according to His word, we will understand it better by and by, by and by. When the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. Tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Temptations hidden share often take us unaware. And our hearts are made to bleed for each thought, whisper, or deed. And we'll wonder why do we have tests when we do our best. We will understand it better by and by, by and by, when the morning comes. All the saints are. God our gathering home, tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. You know, I made that announcement last week about signing up um, for the, the volunteer application sign-up so that we can do the uh, background checks and so that we can get a, a record of, of everybody um, who wants to be a part of that moving forward so, that, so, you can, so you can be a part of everything that we have going on. And I went to, to go pick that first sheet up. I, I put two sheets out there. Um, because I thought that would be more than enough, and I went to go pick the first one up, and I thought it was, you know, mostly filled, and I thought, well, that's, a, that's pretty good, you know, that's, that's good, I'll go ahead and I'll take this sheet, and I'll work on, on getting that in, and then um, I'll leave the other one so that anyone else who wants to can sign up, and so I picked up that first sheet, and it was actually the second sheet, and the first sheet was all the way full underneath it, and so that's why there's not a sheet out there right now, which I'll, I'll work on um, afterwards, and, and I'll try to get that out either this afternoon. If it's not out this afternoon, it'll, it'll definitely be out Wednesday. Um, if you haven't got a chance, you're, you're welcome to also come up to, to myself or to Gary and just make sure that we have down your name and a correct email address for your name. And, um, and we, can get you in. we can get you in ourselves without, without you having to sign up if you want to do that like now, this morning. Um, but that was... That was awesome. You guys are great. There are 36 names on that list right now. Um, and that's phenomenal. And I just wanted to, to say thank you. I wanted to commend you. I wanted to tell you how excited we are for everything that we have going on. I wanted to just um, let you know that, well, well first of all, I'll let you know that there will be another sheet out there. I just, I just have to go print one off. Y'all, you, just, you just exceeded my expectations. That's all that it was. And so thank you for, for being a part of everything that we have going on. Because honestly, you know, um, it's, it's a, everything that we do is a group effort. 
Everything that we do, we do as a family. And it's very important that we recognize that and that we continue to work together as we continue to grow and as we continue to build momentum going into this year. And um, there's a lot of things that we have, we have starting. There's a lot of things that we're continuing that we're really excited about. We're grateful to have some of you back with us who have, who have been out sick um, and who have been recovering. And we miss you when you're not here. Your presence is noticed. It's appreciated. It's encouraging. But we definitely miss you when you're not here. We'll be in Genesis chapter 32 today. If you have your Bibles and want to turn there with me, we'll begin to read in Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 22. The same night he arose, Jacob, and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And then he took them and sent them across the stream, and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place, the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, To this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. This is kind of a crazy story. This is a very unique and very intriguing account that we have in Genesis. Now we know, we know that, that during the days of the patriarchs that, that men walked with God and they spoke with God sometimes and that God interacted with them in ways that, that was, was unlike the ways that He interacted with the, the men and, and women of the Mosaic age under the Mosaic law. And, and it's, it's different than He interacts with, with us now under the new law. But even so, even amongst, uh, even in a time when, when God would appear to people in different forms, as He appeared to the prophets, or as He appeared to Moses in, in the burning bush, there are different places in the Old Testament where God appears to man in different forms, But this one is a little bit different. Because instead of God appearing to Jacob in, say, a burning bush to express a a supernatural side of Himself that that demands, demands reverence, that demands a a subservient attitude, a, a, a recognition of the holy nature, the holy experience that's going on. Rather, in this passage, what we find is that Jacob, in the middle of the night, finds himself wrestling physically with God in the form of a man. It's unlike anything else we see, and and it's and it seems so out of place, but there are a couple of things about this account we need to understand going forward, right? So a little bit of context about this account. In 
Hebrew, and I am by no means a Hebrew scholar. Languages are not my strong suit, okay? But thankfully, they are the strong suit of other individuals who write books and resources and, and make it a lot easier for us to understand. And we have a lot of, a lot of tools written by a lot of very smart people who have who've studied the languages of the Old and New Testament extensively. So we're able to know a little bit. One thing that we do know is that when the, when the original readers of Genesis would have read this account, something very specific would have stood out to them. <clears throat> and it's part of the, the, the literary makeup of this account. right? The Hebrew reader would have noticed that Ya'ekob, Jacob, Yabok, the Jabok River, and Ye'abek, the verb he wrestled, all sound very similar. It doesn't sound very similar in, in English, but it sounds very similar in Hebrew. And it's, it's a literary device that Moses would have used as he wrote this to tie in the relevance of one to another. Showing everybody, showing the, the reader that this isn't coincidental, that it's very intentional, that they're related to one another as they go on. That, that, that Jacob, in this place, has a holy experience with God. Another significant thing that, that a Hebrew reader would have known that we may not understand without doing a little bit deeper of a dive is the significance of the names in this account. The name Jacob means supplanter or, or heel grabber or the one who follows after. Right. So when Jacob and Esau were born, they were twins, but Esau was born with the inheritance, right? But as Esau was born, he was born with Jacob attached to his heel. That Jacob was reaching after him. And that's the story of Jacob's life. And his name, the, the, the one who follows after, or the supplanter, or the heel grabber, that's the story of his life. That's the story of his life up to this point. Because as he struggles with his brother Esau in their younger days, and he struggles with, with his brother who's only a few seconds older than he is, who has the inheritance, who has the blessing of God and of his Father. And he struggles with this, and then eventually, you know the story, how Jacob deceives Isaac and and obtains the blessing that belongs to Esau, and how he, he trades Esau some, some soup for his birthright. And so, Jacob is always chasing after. He's always seeking to overcome people in his life. We see the same thing that he does with Laban. Right? And he's not... Jacob isn't necessarily deceptive of Laban. He's honest with Laban. Rather, Laban is deceptive with, with Jacob. But there's this constant strife. There's this constant strife, and it seems like everywhere that he goes, he's either struggling with Esau throughout his entire childhood until he becomes a man, and he goes straight from that situation into another. And it's either Esau or Laban for his entire life. And as we find him in Genesis 32, he has just escaped Laban. He has just, in the previous chapter, escaped the, the house of Laban and been able to take his, his wives, Leah and Rachel, away from Laban, who has changed his wages time after time and who has been dishonest with him time after time. And he finally, God tells Jacob, go to the land that I have promised your fathers and leave this place. And so he does. 
And so Jacob finally gets up the courage and he just gathers his whole family and he gathers all of the people that are with him and he leaves. And here we find Jacob alone in the wilderness. Why is Jacob alone? If he gathered his whole family and he gathered all of the people that traveled with him and his servants and his wives and his children, why is Jacob alone at this point? See, Jacob knows that they are about to encounter his older brother Esau. And he fears Esau. Because the last time that Jacob encountered Esau, Esau was planning to kill him. Esau was incredibly angry with him. And since this time, both Jacob and Esau have done well for themselves and have established themselves as as fathers of their own people. But Jacob knows that Esau is a hard man. And he knows that he's done him wrong in the past. And so he's afraid. He's afraid. And so he's sent his people and his flocks before him. And he's kept with him his family and his wives. But on this night, he sends them ahead of him across the river, across the Jabbok. And he's alone. Maybe he just needed some time to think. Maybe he just needed some time to prepare himself for what the following day or two were going to entail. And that's relatable, is it not? And it seems like he's seems like he's leaving one problem and he's walking head first into another. And he says, Man, if I could just get some time to think, if I could just have a night that was just peace and quiet that I could just be alone, and, and I could just get myself collected, then maybe I could, I could figure out what I'm going to do here, and we can get through this with as little damage as possible. That night wasn't as peaceful as Jacob had hoped it was going to be. And as Jacob sits alone in the dark, he finds himself encountering a stranger who basically assaults him. And they wrestle during the whole night. And this man that Jacob wrestles with is not, is not everything he seems to be. Because at first, he would appear as, as an intruder into his camp. As someone who posed a threat. And so Jacob wrestles with this man to defend himself, but also to subdue this attacker who he can only assume means him harm. And yet, you've got to think about that moment of realization. When Jacob is finally starting to get the upper hand on this attacker, and then he simply reaches out and touches the side of Jacob's hip. And his bones are immediately out of place. And Jacob understands. And he recognizes that this person whom he's wrestling with is greater than he is. He is a superior of some sort. And maybe he doesn't know yet whether it's God, or whether it's an angel, or whether it's a prophet, or or a messenger of the Lord but he understands that he is superior. But he doesn't let go. He doesn't let go. Because even after Jacob's hip is put out of joint, and the man says to him, let me go for the day is broken, Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. That's Jacob. That's Jacob for you. If anything sums up the attitude of Jacob through Genesis up until this point, it's that right there. That even though he knows at this point that he is entirely outclassed, and he knows at this point that something's going on because if this man wanted to, he could break every bone in my body with just lifting a finger. Because all he did was touch my side and he put my whole, my whole hip 
out of place. But he doesn't let go. He doesn't let go because Jacob just doesn't know when to quit, apparently. But he holds on for a blessing. He holds on for a blessing. Instead of letting go. That would have been the easy thing to do. As a matter of fact, it probably would have been the smart thing to do at that point. But he held on for a blessing. You know, as, as wild and as, and as interesting and intriguing as this, as this whole scenario is, as, as, as out of place as it seems from the rest of, of Scripture, kind of, it's so relatable. I've never seen God face to face. I've certainly never engaged in a, in a wrestling match with God. Physically. But I think all of us at some point have been wrestling with God spiritually. I think all of us at some point have been so obstinate or ornery, as my mama would say, that we just wouldn't let go of whatever it was that we had latched onto, whatever that thing was that was causing us to struggle with and to wrestle with God, that we just wouldn't let go of whatever that was. So it's a kind of relatable to think about struggling with God and wrestling with God and how sometimes that means that I am not doing the things that I know that I'm supposed to be doing. Sometimes it's just me being stubborn. And it's just me trying to pose a battle of wills against the Almighty God in which I end up losing ten times out of ten. However, you know, struggle is not always bad. You know, wrestling with God doesn't always mean that, that I'm wrestling with, with God as in I'm, I'm prioritizing sin over Him. No, a lot of times wrestling with God is just struggling with reality. It's just struggling with life. It's just struggling with how God fits into my life. I know I've told you this before, but honestly, one of the most pivotal moments of my personal walk in faith was when I went to my father, and I, I don't remember how old I was, probably 14 or 15, and, and I went to my father, and I don't remember what it was. I don't remember what it was that I was struggling with. I don't remember what it was about. All I remember is his answer. Because I said, Dad, I'm really struggling with this. And he looked at me and he said, good. And I didn't know how to respond to that. No, it's not good. Struggling hurts. This is uncomfortable. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. I'm, I'm, I'm all torn up about this thing that's impacting my faith. How do, how do I make sense of how God fits in to this part of my life? to these things that are going on. It doesn't make sense. I'm struggling with this. Good. I'm glad that you're struggling. And I'm glad that you're still wrestling because it means that you haven't given up yet. Because through struggles come blessings. And you may not see the whole picture yet. But you keep fighting anyways. Struggling is hard. It's not fun and it's not attractive, but there are blessings in trials and in struggles. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, 
Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now realistically, you and I both know that we're never going to be perfect or complete by ourselves or by our own doings, or by our own works, but rather, God makes us perfect and complete through His sacrifice. And through our joining with Him, and through our our unification with Christ in His baptism and in His death, we are made perfect as He is perfect. That it's not my own wrestling that gains me the prize. It's not my own struggling or my own doing that makes me perfect, but the blessings that come through those struggles, those trials, are blessings that come through Christ. Blessings that come through God. Because I've struggled, because I've remained faithful in my struggles, there's a difference in wrestling with God and wrestling or fighting against God. There's a difference in wrestling with God and fighting against Him. Struggling is okay. It hurts, and it's not fun. And it's not attractive. It's not glamorous. But it's a part of growing. And it's a part of life. And it's a part of our walk and our faith with Him. So when it seems like the odds are stacked against you, don't let go. Hold on. Like Jacob held on. You see, Jacob had to be changed. Jacob had to be changed from Jacob, the heel grabber, the one who follows after, the supplanter, who, who fights his own battles and who struggles with man to Israel, which means God contends or God fights for or the man who fights with God. You see that juxtaposition of how Jacob changed from a man who relied so heavily on on his birthright and on his blessing to a man who allowed God to fight his battles with him and for him. Through Jacob's through Jacob's life thus far up until this point, he trusts heavily on his birthright, and on the blessing that he got from his father Isaac. Even when he's dealing with Laban, when he's with Laban, when he's continuing to work with Laban, when he's managing both of their flocks of sheep, their herds of sheep, and he's managing these sheep, and they're increasing in wealth and prosperity, and they don't have a bad year as long as Jacob is there. And the sheep that are supposed to, to produce babies and supposed to grow the flock, they do just that. And they don't die during the process. And they don't lose sheep. They continue to gain. And that means that Laban continues to gain stature and continues to gain wealth and continues to gain prominence because of his ties with Jacob. And Laban tells Jacob that he knows that it's because of Jacob. That God has told him it's because of Jacob that he has succeeded. And yet, when Jacob takes his daughters, when Jacob takes his two wives, Laban's daughters, and his family, and he retreats from Laban, and Laban follows after him, even then, Laban tells Jacob that God had told him not to harm Jacob. And so we see Jacob throughout his interactions 
previously, relying on the blessing, relying on the birthright. But we don't see him fully trusting in God until this point. And we see that in Genesis chapter 35, verse 5, as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And now Jacob is a nation. Now Jacob is a people. He's a tribe. And his entire family is protected. And the people around him and all the nations surrounding know that they travel with the power of the one true God protecting them. So the question comes back to us, who's fighting your battles? I'm not strong enough to fight my battles by myself. I'm not strong enough to win all those matches. I can't overcome all the obstacles that life throws out me by myself. And honestly, I gain nothing by trying that. I gain nothing by trying to do it all myself. I gain nothing by pushing God away from me. There's no blessing in separating myself from God. My sins have already done that. My mistakes have already separated me from God. The choices that I've made to put other things in His place and to prioritize myself and my desires and my wants above the commandments of God, above my love for Him, above my obedience to Him and my faith in Him, that's already separated me from God. Now I just want to get back to Him. Now I just want to make sure that I'm united with Him and that we're standing together against anything and everything that this life has to throw at us. Let God fight your battles. Struggle with His Word. I really appreciated Brother Moore's prayer this morning. And the honesty, the honesty that was in it. Because he's right. I don't always remember to put the the study, the dwelling in the Scripture on a daily priority like I should. Life gets busy. Life gets really busy. And there's a lot of things that come up every single day. But to spend time in, and to invest in, and to live in God's Word, and to not just read it at surface value, but to digest it, and to wrestle with it, and to struggle with it, that's growth. That's growth that we need and that we have to have if we're to stay spiritually alive in Him. And the more that we struggle with it, the more that we realize we're unable to do it by ourselves. The more that we realize what we're looking forward to at the end. You see, Jacob, he trusted a lot in his earthly birthright. But you and I have a heavenly inheritance. That's our birthright. As sons and daughters of God, as adopted heirs, you and I have reserved for us a home in heaven if we've been added to His family. If 
We've put our old selves to death with Him. If we've been buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of our sins, if we've, in essence, as Jacob did, had our name changed, if we've wrestled with God, and we've been made anew, and we've been adopted by Him into His family, then that is our inheritance. But it's a conditional inheritance. And it requires that you and I keep up our end of the deal. That we continue to place Him as the priority in our life. So if you've never been baptized or added to His family, and if you've never claimed that inheritance, or if you've allowed other things to become the priority in your life, would you make that right? So that one day, when all of this is done, you and I, we can go home together. We can share in that inheritance together. If we can assist you in any way, would you come as together we stand and sing? Now I am coming on the path of sin. How long I try, Lord, I am coming on, coming on, coming on. Never more. Josh for another good lesson this afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you for being here and to our visitors. We welcome you and you're always welcome here at Brownsburg. At this time, Brother Eric Mackey will be leading our closing prayer and will be dismissed to our 130 services. Pray with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day you've given us and letting us be here today. We pray for those that are mentioned earlier on the sick list. Please help them to get better and be back in our number once again. 
please keep us on your straight and narrow at all times, and please forgive us when we fall short of your glory. Please be with us as we struggle through life, and help us always victorious as we leave this place. Please be with us on the road, and keep us safe till the next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.